Awesome, guys. Thank you for joining us. And today I have uh, I have my friend here, Boris Sanchez. Boris is not, not new here. He's from Sandmore Investments. Uh, um, he's a principal uh, with his company. And, and today we're just going to we're going to talk about various topics, one being the feds, where they are. We're going to talk about multifamily. I want to hear his perspective. You know, Boris is a is a seasoned investor. He's been here before. He's originally from Colombia. Bienvenido, my brother. Uh, thank you for being here today. And, um, you know, I just, just, we're just going to talk, we're going to talk shop and, and allow people just to kind of hear two seasoned investors talking about, Hey, what we see, what we think, uh, what are you experiencing? I know that your market is Houston, as you was telling me off air, my brother, so, um, that you're looking to buy and out in other, in other places. Uh, but my first question I want to start asking you is I want to, I want to get into your world a little bit, brother is, um, what do you see, right? Coming down the pipeline, as we, we record this podcast today, tamo, que tamo, tamo, Jan, uh, February uh, 11th. 11th, February 11th today, right? And uh, February 11th, 2022, and the feds are threatening to, not threatening, they're assuring us that they're going to raise the rates next month. People, and a lot of investors, me included, I have some five five one arms out there, and um, I'm in the middle of refinancing, refinancing some of those because you know, have a little experience. So we're looking to get into long-term fixed debt, getting out of those things. And before the rates go, go crazy. What are your projections that you have currently have, you just mentioned to me, you have 600 doors, right? Is it 640, 600? What did you say exactly? Uh, 652. And yeah, thank you for bringing me on Martin. You're welcome Uh, brother. You're welcome. Back uh, and talking with you and and your audience. Um, yeah, we're up to 652 units right now. We're expanding uh, my company, Sandmore Investments. We have um, a brokerage and an ownership arm. So in our brokerage, we're actually expanding to other markets within Texas first, and then we'll start going national. Got it, got it. So, 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 Dime, what are you seeing? I want to talk about Texas because Texas is a hot market, brother. I mean, you guys got migration up the gazoo, right? You got Florida and then Texas people moving uh, you know, as we both know, population growth, unemployment rate yeah, are the yeah. two key metrics, right, for, for, for multifamily, for investors, period. Uh, tell me, what are you seeing in your market? Um, how, are, how are you guys being competitive? You kind of have a, a competitive advantage right now because you are in, you're the broker. Right. So one of the things that we're experiencing, my partner and I, one of my partners, my, my syndication partner and I, is that um, brokers are not calling us back. Right. So if you don't have a previous relationship, right. brokers are like brokers are like right now, the commercial brokers are like the, the hot girl in the club. Right. <laughs> you were young, the hottest girl in the club that that she used to think she was all that. Like, that's how brokers are right now. Right. That's the best metaphor I can use. They're not calling back. If we got money. We're ready to execute. We have experience We're you know, but but not llamando. they're not calling us. So. So how are you guys taking deals down right now? Tell me about that. How, how is Sandmore taking deals down right now? So we're uh, still taking deals down the same way we always have, which is, you know, uh, I'm a big fan of active investments over syndication. I believe, and I've studied this, and I've had 12 years of experience now doing this, that uh, I find that uh, equity, is, equity giveaway is more expensive than debt, you know? Mm-hmm. If, uh, if you know creative financing, such as, you know, hard money or bridge into perm, then you can figure things out a lot better. Uh, just so happens that here in Texas, we have a program that allows us to borrow up to 100% of the cost of the project, purchase and rehab included, um, as long as it meets certain qualifications. But um, so obviously that coupled with the fact that we are brokers, I can cherry pick my own deals. Uh, but I can't buy it all, right? A lot of people ask me, oh, why are you selling this great deal? Hey, look, I just bought, I just closed 167 units last month. I can't buy it right now. You know, I'm, I'm like, okay, hang on. <laughs> hold so, up, hold up, hold up, because there's something to unpack there, my brother. Sure. So you have a program, and we're going to have to talk about this off air a little bit, or maybe if you want to share it with, with the audience, that'd be great. You have a program, you have access to some capital for large multifamily that'll give you um, 100% purchase and 100% rehab as long as is there is one of the criteria that there needs to be a value add play component on that uh what what does that look like because that sounds like an amazing amazing platform 
Yeah, uh, yeah, it is. I mean, uh, I've kind of develop, been developing this with the, the hard money lender. Uh, so it's it allows me to borrow up to 70% of the future as repaired value. Mm -hmm. uh, the interest rate is high as 12%. But I think on small to medium multifamily, like the ones we're buying, I think uh, those are those are great. Um, I, the smallest one I've bought was four units, you know, eight, 10, 12. The largest one I've bought that way was 100 units. Um, I just recently, my 167 that I closed last month uh, was done through a bridge loan where I brought in uh, some money. I brought in 10% and then that lowered the rate a little bit because uh, on larger projects, you're going to be in hard money for a long time. And so it, it doesn't make it worth it. It becomes too expensive. So it's, it's actually great for small to medium uh, commercial multifamily. Got it, my brother. So even a cosa. Um... What what does that mean for someone that might be listening to us that doesn't understand what we're talking about, right? Um, what does that mean to have bridged that? What it, just for maybe just ex, kind of explain that to someone that might be listening, que tal vez no sabe what what, yeah. right? So, <laughs> no so what is that? So uh, bridge is a type of commercial loan that allows you to bridge the gap between you know like not owning it and then long term financing, right? So it's a bridge loan that allows you to bring in a little less down payment. Uh, otherwise, a bank will generally ask for 20 to 25 percent down, which can be hard, you know, on a cash flow. Um, and it doesn't it's not scalable. So it's very popular to use in um, in, in, in commercial lending, commercial uh, investing, mm -hmm. um, because it, it allows you to bring in less money to close. We just brought it a step further and we're like, OK, we're not even doing a down payment. We're just, you know, the, our heart, my lenders letting us borrow 100 percent. Uh, and this is a product that I'm, I do offer all through Texas and I'm trying to bring it coast to coast. But that's also experience too, brother. Cause I have, you know, I have relationships with, with my, with my hard money lenders as well, that they'll offer me hundred percent, same kind of deal, 70, 75% um, of the ARV. Uh, but you know, you got to have experience, right? You got to know what yeah. you're doing. They're not going to give that to, to someone that's just starting out that doesn't know the game. So if someone's listening out there, how, how would someone get started, right, in buying multifamily? Before you answer that, let me backtrack a little bit. Why do you choose, why does Sandmore Investment chooses to invest in multifamily rather than single family? And I, we've kind of talked about this before, but but why don't you let us know a little bit? What, why? Sure. It's one of the most, uh, my, my most, uh, one of the most interesting things that I like to talk about, because what I say kind of tends to shock people. When I tell them that investing in residential is actually riskier than investing in commercial. In residential, you only have three ways out of a deal. You can sell, you can owner finance, or you can rent, but you cannot do a combination of the three. You can't rent a house and then try to sell it. It's just not going to sell that way. People want it so they can live in it. Mm -hmm. But in turn, commercial is uh, more attractive the fuller it is, right? You can completely rent it and then put it on the market which actually makes it great because it doesn't matter how long it's going to be in the market if the owner is still making money, right? Cash flow. Got it. Got it. That, that makes a lot of sense. Um, that, that makes a ton of sense. And then you have also the economy of scales, right? You, you have the- Right. Uh, so yeah. in, in, yes, you're right. The economy is a scale of where I can actually put management. Uh, it's more intensive into one uh, deal. Um, uh, you know, obviously all, all expenses become cheaper per unit once you have the, the more units. Um, so, and, and obviously the biggest factor uh, behind me uh, and my team investing in multifamily is the fact that we have what's called forced appreciation. That's right. Which is when you, you uh, force the, the, the value up of the property. Um, How is that you're done? Raising rents because you're lessening expenses. And so that uh, is not available in residential. If you have a hundred thousand dollar house, and you rent it out for twenty thousand dollars a month. It's still a hundred thousand dollar house. So uh, that's the, not the same in, in commercial. So we are, we have been uh, trying to refine the process of uh, raising the income, lowering the expenses, and then hiking up that that uh, forced appreciation uh, so that we can capitalize on that later. As I like to say, Martin, and, and sometimes sometimes people don't like me saying this, but Honestly, cash flow is only a wealth maintainer. It's mm -hmm. not a wealth builder. Cash flow will only maintain your current wealth level, but forced appreciation has the actual 
power of uh, bringing you to another wealth level. For example, I bought a 200, I'm sorry, I bought an eight unit apartment complex for $260,000. It has been sitting on the market for like a long time. It was falling apart. Uh, You know, I used hard money to uh, buy it and then I rehabbed it with another $260,000. Yep. Um, A year, so, you know, obviously I I, I rehabbed it very nicely. Um, I I put, you know, put in very good tenants. A year after me buying it at $260,000, I sold it for $1.2 million. So, that's a $600,000 profit. That's something that cash flow can't do for you right now. Uh, but you can do a lot with that 600,000. You can actually keep on scaling up and buying more and then getting more cash flow. I do believe in cash flow, but just long term, not right away. Got it. So so why did you choose with that particular one? How how did you process that? Why did you make the decision, "Hey, I'm going to sell this one." Why went there instead of keeping it? for the long run right where you did you 1031 that into a bigger deal that you 1031 that 600k into this 160 unit uh deal you just bought or or tell me about how you how you decide that how do you decide for that for someone that's listening so they can try to um learn how you process that yeah so uh how did i how how did i process that um i mean i think uh you know, I, I, you know, it, obviously, I have to, I have to thank my team uh, when it comes to that. Uh, we have, we have a great team that allows us to actually um, uh, increase it. Uh, you, you mentioned the, uh, the, like the, the type of debt that we're using, or what do you mean? No, no. Um, how, how did you decide to sell that eight unit? Oh, rather than hold it, right? Oh, how, did, how did you guys, you and your team, process that decision? Hey, you know what? We got 600k in, in 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 equity in this one. Let's just flip it a year later and 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 move on. Versus, hey, let's keep it for cash flow. And I want to talk a little bit. I also want to unpack what you said about different levels of wealth. I want to talk about wealth and a wealthy mindset. Different level, but I want to know first how you guys decided on that that decision. So I could have 1031. I, I, I yeah, I realized I know you were talking about 1031. So uh, I, I could have 1031 it, uh, but it just so happens that right now I have so much depreciation for my 140, 32 units that I have. I have, you know, different complexes everywhere. And that depreciation alone is enough for me to offset taxes that I gain off of that 600,000. So I didn't have to, but Beautiful. if you're beginning out, I would completely do it because then you're going to be paying, you know, 30, 35%, something crazy like that capital gains on, on that flip. Uh, so um, it was, it was measured. Uh, it was something that obviously it was strategic yep. and, uh, I, that allowed me to buy more actually allowed me to, uh, pay off some smaller property that I have and, you know, just kind of keep growing that way. Obviously I, I, I spent some of it. <laughs> <laughs> Is that Ferrari you got, bro? I see, I see your Ferrari club online and, and, and <laughs> buying them cars, but I want to talk about the, um, uh, I want to talk about some really, really high level you just said, right? And I want to unpack that because there might be people listening that don't know. Whoa, that sounds, that's, whoa, that's really high level stuff, what you just said. So let's, I want to unpack that a little bit. First of all, 1031 is when you take, when you take from a uh, same and like asset and you, and your capital, you can move it into another at same and like asset and you avoid paying taxes that year. What explain to us, for those that are listening that, that are, aren't familiar with the 1031, but what I want you to explain to us is when you said, uh, you said, I took, I have enough depreciation with all of my other assets. Okay. We're talking right. really, really high level wealthy people shit here right now. Right. <laughs> Abby, right? I have, I have enough depreciation with, with all of my other assets. And I took that $600,000 on that flip, right? Because I would have paid on, on my flips because we flip, right? Part of, my, part of my company, we flip, we buy, hold, and we flip. That's our two strategies. Right. Um, when, when, you're, when you're paying, when, when you flip a property, you know the one-year rule. You, if you own it for less than a year, right, uh, you have to own it for a year and a day so you don't avoid that, self, that, that, that flipper tax, which is active income versus, versus passive. Right. You said run something very strategic. You held it for a year. After a year, you sold it. So yeah, yeah. When, when you take, when you said you took that 600,000, right. And profit you made in that, in that, in that eight, in that eight unit. And it was a strategic move because 
you have enough depreciation on all of your other stuff. Please unpack that. When you say depreciation on all of your other stuff, on all of your other assets, what do you mean by that? So, so people can understand that maybe someone's listening and they don't, they don't know what you're saying. Right? Sure. Explícame eso. Go. So, no problem. As, uh, you know, as I told you, I have, you know, 12 years of doing this. And honestly, I've been focusing on this for the last 12 years is growing uh, and scaling up. So um, that a lot has allowed me to uh, have a nice portfolio of 652 units. Largest one, which is a 100 unit apartment complex. I have a 32, a 40, a 24, class A, uh, class B and C mainly. Uh, so because I have so much depreciation, I'm 100% owner of the 100 unit. I'm 100% owner of the 40, the 32, everything. Uh, so uh, because I am 100% uh, owner of that, it allows me to like soak in all of the depreciation that, an, uh, that, a, that a building makes. Obviously, we know that real estate doesn't really depreciate, but according to IRS law, you can depreciate an asset like yeah. such as real estate. And there is really no larger... Um, uh, I guess tax break, legal tax break than than commercial real estate. It's not even residential. Actually, you know, uh, Trump got in trouble for that or trouble uh, for that a few uh, uh, years ago when he was trying to uh, kind of like, well, I don't want to get into politics, but he, that's that's what he was doing is he was using all his his real estate in order to offset the taxes. And so it's actually a very popular way for wealthy people to do it. Um, uh, and so, uh, it, it, yeah, I've, I've kind of learned from that and I've been scaling up and actually that depreciation is what's allowed me to uh, cash out and then not 1031 exchange, but rather keep all the profit from a property and then keep uh, buying more and scaling more. Got it, my friend. OK, I want to kind of switch gears a little bit into I want to get your thought, you know, as a seasoned investor and high level investor, you know, 650 units. What do you see, man? Um, what do you see with these threats? What's you know, we're in a weird time right now, right? We have the issue of and 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 this is a question that I kind of debated with my team a little bit because I'm constantly watching this stuff, right? So we have we have the issue right now going on as we speak, the potential threat in the Ukraine, right? We have Ukraine and Russia, Russia being the number two or number three um oil they, they're the number one oil provider to the all of europe russia is if we have gases here in the u.s through the roof we have um now uh, biden backing out of the the deal the sanctions with iran and they're going after nukes now we have israel potentially um having conflicts because iran said that if um if they get their hands on the nukes that they would they will annihilate israel so that's a whole other so that we have oil issues there we have potential oil issues there we have potential issues in, in europe if this happens then you add 2020 um all of these refineries that closed down and it and already the exxon ceo came out and said that it takes 12 to 18 months to reopen a refinery because demand went down for because of covid for right. oil Remember, gas went down, way, went way down, uh, which that's going to slow production. Now, we're already experiencing extremely high uh, levels of, of, of inflation. Right now, we have extremely high levels of inflation. We have gas is expensive. Um, some economists are saying that gas might go up as high as $7. I don't know about that. That could potentially be the case with everything going on when you add all these things. But my question, and I'm getting to my question right now, when you add all of these things up, production, oil, all this stuff, us as investors, you and I, our tenants have to heat up their homes. Our tenants have to go to work, right? So they got to put gas in their cars. Our tenants have to heat up their home. I have, I have three vacancies and I'll share this with you, my friend. I have three vacancies right now um, that we're rehabbing and empty $1,000, $970 in gas, empty houses. I saw the bill the other day, two days ago, and I, and I lost my shit. I, I, I told my admin, I said, you got to call these companies and make sure that they got this right. And it's not a double. And they got it right. It's just, uh, it's gone up. <laughs> it's gone up so much. It, it's just the cost of doing business for us here in, in the Poconos, right? And in, in this side of the world in the Northeast. And we can bear that because we're a business and we have assets and we have different things. I mean, you know, we can bear it as, as best as we possibly are able to um so my my concern is what is happening to the regular american renter 
<laughs> right? Regular American renter, when they start to get these hikes, these exuberant, you know, like, like gas prices, oil prices, energy goes up so high. What, it, what do you see in terms of uh, a potential challenge with our renters making rent payment to us as investors with inflation? What do you see with inflation? What do you see with the feds raising rates? How, how does all of this from your world affects our business, you and, our, you and my business? Sure. Uh, so that's obviously one of the main reasons why people are flocking to Texas. Uh, there's, I heard that there was a, uh, an average of 880 people moving to Texas every day from other places. Wow. So obviously, Texas is growing a lot. Um, you can tell in the real estate, Austin used to be a very cheap market. Now it's one of the most expensive in the country. Uh, I think the same thing is going to happen to Houston, but for right now, I think uh, Houston has has been traditionally a good place to come and and live. The uh, the quality of life for uh, what you're getting paid and, and what the salaries are pretty good. Um, so I think people are going to flock to these areas first. Obviously, there uh, you know obviously Chicago is dwindling in uh, in population, we're going to, Houston is going to surpass it as the number three uh, most populous city in the US. And so, you know, people are realizing this. Um, I'm not sure what uh, the politics itself uh, of, of the world are going to do for inflation. I'm sure it's not gonna do great things, right? Obviously it's uh, things are more expensive. And if uh, there's a supply chain issue because of war or because of whatever, um, then things uh, will get more expensive, starting with gas. Right. Um, but then also you have the Fed that's raising rates uh, for residential. That's one of the things that folks uh, may not realize is that uh, commercial is priced differently. Um, now they're all kind of in the same market. They're all in the same markets, right? But um, some of it uh, in commercial is, is priced off of Prime or LIBOR or something like that instead of the Fed rates. So um, it actually has maintained pretty steady through the uh, pandemic. And now I think they're just now about to raise it. Um, but again, that's why I'm a big fan of knowing your finance products, uh, because there are finance products out there that allow you to borrow down to 2.5 percent right now. Uh, you know, obviously, they'll, they'll, they'll include something like HUD uh, or agency or something like that. But uh, it's entirely possible to do that. I got it. I got it. What, what, so, so you don't, you don't think that raising of the rates um, will have an impact on, on uh, cap rates, compressing, uh, decompressing cap rates. I kind of disagree with you there because I think that when rates, when interest rates as a whole go up, I think that it will decompress cap rates a little bit because we will be affected on the commercial side eventually well you know because this yeah. money is uh, what, I, what i mean is uh what i meant is yes uh from from the side of like demand uh and 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 uh rates rising I, it wouldn't affect the commercial market so much but now yes you you are right if uh if the rates actually do rise in residential obviously people will actually look to invest more in commercial which is actually going to make it uh more attractive for commercial owners Mm -hmm. uh, and that's kind of been the um, the trend whenever something like, um, uh, you know, uh, like world economy uh, based uh, happens is that, you know, obviously people will flock away from things like gold and then they'll seek out real estate. Uh, mm -hmm. Most of the time they'll be in commercial real estate. So it's looked at like a safe haven. I think of it as one of the best assets you can own. There's really no better asset to own other than commercial. Uh, so. Yeah, I think it's actually only going to probably help uh, that rates are rising residentially, right? Uh, because I think commercial owners will see a rise in uh, occupancy as people elect to not buy anymore, but rather rent because it's, it becomes too expensive to own. So um, I think it's going to be a nice trend for commercial owners. Got it. Got it. Um, I want to. I want to. I want to transition into a little bit of of, uh, you know, how, how does one become rich, right? How does one become wealthy in, in, in our space, right? And there's different, there's a lot of different ways that you can become rich, right? And you can become wealthy. 
in real estate, but more so in multifamily investing. What does that mean, right? Um, what what is that muscle when it, in terms of money that one has to build, right, to become rich in in multi in the multifamily in the multifamily space? I think the very first thing uh, that people should do is learn their finance products first. So, so when people ask me, hey, how do I get started? You know, I have a little bit of money saved. How do I get started? I'm like, look, the very best asset that you could possibly have is your own mind uh, and your own education. Uh, educate yourself. There is a plethora of information out there, free information for anybody willing to learn on the Internet. Um, and so... You know, learn about commercial valuation, learn uh, about uh, commercial loans, shadow people who do it already, uh, talk to them, you know, go visit them and everything like that. I love when people come to my office and they just want to pick my brain. Um, I do have a mentoring program for those interested in actually uh, learning from me directly about commercial real estate. But aside from that, um, if you are just more of the self learner, I would just you know, obviously pick up, you know, a book, pick up, uh, you know, the YouTube videos and, and uh, you know, visit a lot of those uh, investment encyclopedias in, in the Internet and arm yourself first. And bef before you spend one dime in investments, arm yourself with information and you will see what I'm saying is true. Spending your money in commercial, even if it's small commercial, such as a fourplex, fiveplex, a small shopping center small uh, storage facility, something like that will actually, um, you know, enlarge and multiply your investment rather than just make you a return. So we're talking about, you, you were asking me, how do we build wealth? How do you actually build wealth? Well, I'm telling you, the only way that I found that to be true is when you multiply your investment, you don't make a return. For example, if you have $100,000 that you've saved all your life, and you're making an 8% return, which is acceptable right now, you're only making $8,000 a year. Again, you're not making any more, it's not making you rich. It's right. currently maintaining the same uh, level of wealth that you have, right? But in, instead, if you take those $100,000 and you spend uh, $50,000 in, in a commercial property, and after going through the motions and everything like that, you're, uh, you're netting three, four, five hundred thousand dollars, you have multiplied your investment. And so I think as a society, we're kind of way too stuck on the returns. Um, and we have kind of ignored what multiplies your investment. And I really think that's the only way to wealth. What multiplies your investment? So Tell like them. I said, forced appreciation mm -hmm. uh, of properties. Uh, if I'm if you know if I'm learning, that's why I said you know educate yourself because if I'm learning about hard money lenders and how it works, in your state, obviously, I can't offer this everywhere yet. But in your state, I'm sure there's some uh, like something similar where you can um, uh, buy a property at you know 90 and 95, 100 percent of cost. Um, okay. And then let's say it's a 12 unit apartment complex, like I see around for you know 600 thousand dollars or whatever. Um, you can actually make that and then you know raise the rents, renovate it, and everything like that. The loan can provide for all this. Uh, afterwards, it'll be worth, you know, $900,000. And then you would have initially, you know, after spending uh, $150,000, you would have essentially made $150,000. So you would have multiplied your investment, you know, by 300%, not just made a return on it. Um, and so that's literally the way that I like and I only invest is if my money is being multiplied, never returned. I love it. You know, that, that the, the whole uh, returns education has been handed to us from billionaires that we listen to uh, because we look up to them. But honestly, they invest completely different than your average citizen. 99.9% .9 of us have less uh, than a million dollars in our accounts, right? And so if, if you're taking a million dollars, if you actually get there, if you, send, you, you saved up or you invested enough to get a million dollars, uh, and you put it for uh, for uh, an eight percent return, you can get eighty thousand dollars a year, which is you know mm -hmm. obviously pretty good. It's livable, right? So um, I would say that's your threshold. Unless you have a million dollars ready to invest, ready to lose, right? Uh, ready to be risked in an investment where you can make a, a passive return, I would not do it. I would I would just invest in something that multiplies your investments. 
I, I love that, man. That's 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 really sound, wise yeah. advice. Um, and I and 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 it's it's interesting because like we have right now only an eight unit similar to yours. We're buying it for two forty. We're putting one hundred and ninety into it, and my valuation conservatively um, is like nine hundred thousand dollars. So yeah, yeah, uh, and yeah. same deal going with a hard money lender. Or they're giving me ninety percent loan to cost, so I'm only for very little money into the deal. And um, you know, listening to you right now and kind of picking, just getting, getting, getting to see how you how you process stuff. Um, you know, my my original thought with that particular property was, hey, I'm gonna refi and maybe take a couple hundred thousand out, keep the asset, let it cash flow, and then keep keep taking that money and keep you know what I mean, keep multiplying it. Um, but maybe maybe I'll sell it. You know what I mean? I don't I don't know where I'll be in in six months or you know right, right. Or a day from now. All right. Yeah, you should always, as an investor, uh, you know, I, I just don't believe I'm, I'm, you know, obviously I'm way different, Martin, than, than a lot of people that uh, kind of like, you know, just echo the same thing. But I don't believe in the BRRR method. I don't think it applies to the commercial space because in commercial, as you'll see in your eight plex, mm -hmm. you're going to have to renovate it, fill it up and then probably refinance it and i gotta then, refi because it's a hard money you gotta refi because you gotta stabilize it and then yep. that's the whole point of actually selling it is mm -hmm. you know if your cash flow is is pretty good you know let's say you're making a good three four five thousand dollars on your eight plex mm -hmm. uh you're okay even if you put it for sale and you stand to make you know six five hundred thousand dollars or something like that mm -hmm. you don't really are going to mind uh how long it's going to be in the market that's right once it does sell um you're gonna you're gonna take those five hundred thousand dollars and you're gonna invest it in a larger apartment complex mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. Yeah, that's right, man. I, I really appreciate you, brother, coming on here. And my last question is, what what do you see for the future of real estate right now? Because it's really weird times, you know. Um, inflation numbers just came out. We we we're at seven nine that seven. 40 year high since 1982, the highest since 1981, sorry, 7.5. That's wrong. Um, if, if you just go shopping, you'll see that it's a lot higher than that. Doesn't make sense. Um, but that's what they're telling us it is. That's what the CPI came out and said, the, the consumer price index came out and said, we, we have unemployment. It's low. It's weird, right? Unemployment slow. Real estate is at a 16% year over year, January to January 21 to January 22 across the country is up 16% uh, is insane. It, uh, inventory is still extremely low. I could speak for yeah. my market here. We have less than a month of inventory right now. We should have uh, on the Mount, Pocono Mountain um, MLS, there should be 3,000 units. There's only 391, brother. There is wow. like nada. There's just nothing. Um, it's weird, right? And yet interest rates are coming up. So, so on the residential side, you know, interest rates are coming up. What do you predict for for the for the upcoming, you know, the near future here with the economy um, and, and more so in the real estate market? What do yeah, you think? sure. I believe that rates will keep on going up, both commercial and, and residential. Uh, um, and I think that's going to fight a little bit of the uh, inflation that we've been seeing. Obviously, this this huge inflation that we have now is obviously because of um, the uh, supply chain shortages that we've had for everything, you know, cars not being made any or not, not as in many numbers, uh, things, uh, ships getting stuck on, on their way in from the ports. Um, obviously the, this is the side effect of the pandemic. And I think that raising rates, uh, uh, coupled with alleviating supply chain issues are, are going to actually level things out a little bit. But I, that doesn't mean that that real estate would actually get cheaper. As a matter of fact, it's it's trending upwards, especially in those states that uh, are more landlord friendly. Um, and so I, I really think that it just kind of depends per market. But as a whole, uh, the real estate market will be strong. Um, and I believe that prices will plateau and then maybe uh, maybe we'll see some some uh, kind of more of a buyer and seller's market, you know, coming up. Um, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying that it will be a buyer's market, but at least you'll have enough supply to actually level out the, uh, some of these high prices that we've been seeing. Got it. Uh, so, so you're thinking a plateau is what you're, you're yeah, thinking. Yeah, I think so. I mm -hmm. You think this year we'll see a plateau? 
Because um, you're on the both side. I was you're listening to the right here. the other day, and he said, uh, look, things are going to be pretty hairy still for this year. Um, heading into next year, we'll start seeing that. Um, and then he was actually predicting that we're going to enter a recession late 2023 to 2024. Um, so, I mean, you know, um, I, I, I believe it, but also I'm living in the moment. <laughs> I'm just taking, taking right, time brother. to the current market, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, and my last, last question, because I said sure. the last one was the last question, but I, I just, you know, I appreciate these conversations. Um, my next question is I read somewhere and I, maybe you read it too, or you've heard it, but um, I heard an economist or one of these really smart people that, that I listened to and, and they said, or I read it, I can't remember where, but there was a projection that by 2030, America is going to be an, a renter's market that 60% of Americans will be renting. What are your thoughts on that? Absolutely. I believe it. Uh, real estate will get expensive everywhere. I mean, uh, the markets that lead the country, you know, California, New York, Florida, I mean, and now Austin, stuff like that, Denver now, uh, are, are becoming so hot that people uh, cannot afford it, you know? And so either new programs going, are going to have to come out um so that we're so that people can afford this right because financial salaries pro- are staying stagnant financial like, programs you mean right like, yeah financial programs so because program. to alleviate some of this um and i think that that we should look at as, as a society as a, as a country we should look at that in developing more kind of uh, future programs for financing because it look it's trending it's uh, salaries aren't going up as fast as prices are you know mm-hmm. And this was before uh, the the pandemic, um, and so now it's just kind of made things a lot worse. So uh, I really believe um, that yeah, people will actually start flocking to rent uh, and to apartments, um, and it's actually again going to only strengthen the commercial market. And I'm just that makes me more glad <laughs> that I am in a in, in this market and uh, that I got in early. So you you are a believer of that statistic. You, I, I am. I, I personally am, but I, we're both biased, right? Because we're in the real estate space. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Know, so we have a little bit of cognitive cognitive bias to that. Um, but I also am a believer of that sim- for for many of the same reasons that you shared. That's uh, because just inflation, like the price of of real estate, is not uh, the price of people's pay is not keeping up with the price of, of real estate. And, and these young people that are graduating from the universities are just coming out with in an, 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 an crazy amounts of debt that they just can't, they just can't buy real estate. They really just can't. Yeah, and, yeah. and I think that's one of the other contributing factors. Is it a concern for you with, with that being set as an investor or, or how are you and your team processing this? Cause my team and I are processing this ourselves with, with that being the case. And we know, Hey, these kids are coming out with a lot of debt. Uh, people's pay is not keeping up with the, the cost of living and the cost of rent even and the cost of real estate. Is it a concern for you or do you guys uh, are thinking strategically how to hedge against, against that and or how to manage that coming in the future? Because listen, brother, 2030, like it'll be here before we know it, man. We're in 2022. 2030 will be around the corner. We might have a recession in 2023. Who, who knows, man? Because I was I thought it would, we were going to have a recession in, in 2020, right? Right When COVID happened and everything stopped, I said, oh, shit, it's coming, right? But it didn't come. It actually took a turn, and it was it just it, it, real estate just went crazy. It, it took yeah. an opportunity turn. So are you guys strategizing, thinking, thinking about that now? Are you guys considering that? Um, you know, because we're at risk, right? We, we could we, – we own the assets, which is great. Uh, and at the same time, we're also at risk because if people can't afford it, then where do we go, right? Where, yeah. do, where, where, where do we go? Where does our numbers land? Like, then we depreciate our assets because we know it's based on the, 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 the income of the assets. So are you guys thinking about that? I'm curious to, to get your thought on that. Sure. Obviously, look, uh, this kind of excites me uh, because I, I do agree that it's going to be a renter's market in the future. Mm-hmm. Houston is still... Uh, cheap compared to the rest of the country it doesn't have the uh 
levels, uh, the, the real estate levels that other cities do. So I think I'm perfectly poised for it, even though, yes, I do want to expand. But because uh, my foothold as an owner is so good in, 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 in Houston, that puts me at a, an advantage um, that I can, you know, identify good deals and then get in on them hold them for a while if that's the strategic way to go or sell them if, if need be. Um, one thing's for sure, like you said, this future is uncertain. So the only thing I can, uh, I can work with is now the present. Uh, and so if you um, deploy a strategy of uh, renting, keeping cash flow and some selling um, for, you know, obviously for, for forced appreciation of value, then you, uh, that actually is is the, the best way to go. Um, make sure to keep in mind that depreciation is the tax haven uh, that everyone, that all the wealthy people use. And so, uh, you know, obviously they just come up with a plan where, uh, where uh, you can actually benefit from the coming renter's market and benefit from forced depreciation, everything like that. Mm -hmm. Brother, man, I, I so appreciate this conversation, man. I learned a ton from you getting your perspective and, and, and getting thank you so much. Uh, I'm sure that the listeners and our viewers watching us on YouTube uh, have also gained a ton of ton of ton of knowledge. If, if I know you mentioned that you had a, a mentorship program for anyone that as you guys heard this man body says, this is why I had him here sharp 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 mind intelligent seasoned investor from colombia mi hermano gracias for being here um and if anyone wants to connect with you um i know you do all of your stuff 100 finance so you're not looking for investors necessarily but if anyone wants to get mentored by you or wants to wants to go i know you're doing a lot of keynotes and you're you're doing a lot of different things and speaking in a lot of different places i love it because you're, you're sharing you're here you're sharing with people you're helping people get better you're educating people and i think uh that's part of my purpose actually it is my purpose to empower others to become their best version of themselves mm -hmm. through education that's why i do this right you and i are both busy with our own businesses you got 650 units yet you still take time to do things like this and share and you take time to even mentor and, and you know and, and i see you at a lot of different events doing different things so i want to thank you for that personally thank you for that for sharing with the world what you've learned and for helping others right come up uh, i'm a big believer in helping others come up that's the way you go up you, you contribute to prosperity in and of itself and in turn you'll prosper yourself so gracias thank you for that my brother thank you. if anyone wants to wants to connect with you and of course i'm going to put it in the show notes i'm going to put all of your your social media stuff in the show notes and, and people and, and, and your information. But if anyone wants to connect with you, how would they get a hold of you, sir? The best way to do it would be to send me an email. Uh, my email is boris at sandmore.com. Um, and, uh, you know, send me your scenarios. Send me what uh, you'd like to learn about. If you're interested in the mentoring, I can send you some information on that. Um, I am a big believer in like face to face. So I've developed a seven course or seven class course um, where uh, the first three would be face to face. And then the following four classes are um, uh, via Zoom. The reason for that is obviously because I learned from doing, you know, so if if we're not seeing each other face to face, uh, <clears throat> I think that uh you know, it, 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 you're actually kind of missing out because there's only so much I can tell you across the screen. So uh, until I deploy a full um, Zoom or internet mentoring, please uh, come check it out. Uh, I keep my classes very small because I want people to learn one-on-one. -on -one. And one of the classes that we uh, take in the mentoring courses, uh, I, I literally take my people, I put them all in a van and I, sh and I drive around Houston or I have a driver drives around Houston and I show them, you know, uh, here's what we bought it for. Here's what we spent on it. We were going to walk some of our uh, actual projects going on right now. You're going to walk my hundred unit apartment complex. I can tell you the, all the pains of actually owning something like that. So yeah, it's, it's actually very intuitive and that's why I'm a big believer in, in doing face to face. Now, if you are in uh, in other markets and you cannot make it to Houston, at least make it to that one class, and I can figure out how to do the other two via via Zoom. 
Perfecto, hermano. Una preguntita. Will you do that in Spanish too so, to our Latinos, maybe, or anyone que está escuchando in Spanish? I actually have someone that I want to send you that is in Houston that I've kind of been mentoring all the way from here, but that's a different market. So I'm going to connect you two on Facebook, on social media. I'm going to send you a message both. Would you do it in Spanish for some? For Absolutely. Uh, now, the mentoring course is designed to be in English, but if there was enough interest uh, for people to want to do one in Spanish, Absolutamente. I'd love, I'd love to do it. Okay, perfecto, mi hermano. Thank you so much for being here, brother. I really, really appreciate you. This is your home, Latinos in Real Estate Investing Podcast. Anytime you want to come back here, you feel free to come back. Um, is there any events that you're going to be teaching or training at in the near future that maybe um, our listeners can 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 follow you uh, to 20 of those live sure. events? Uh, the do? only one uh, is a new seven course, seven class packet starting in March 15th. Um, you know, and like kind of, we're going to go over everything in commercial real estate, how to evaluate, uh, uh, how to, you know, what, what kind of types of uh, loans are there for commercial real estate, how to bring in the least amount of money. Um, we're going to go over some wholesaling. We're going to go over contracts. We're going to look at live deals. So it's actually very intuitive. Um, the, each class is about two hours, um, one and a, an hour and a half to two hours. And it's chock full of information. Most everybody leaves kind of like wow this is just a lot um but uh, actually that's that's kind of like why i like it because i kind of want to just deploy everything that's in here to you right? right that's right my brother gracias mi hermano thank you so much again we're going to have you on here soon again um as soon as the market changes a little bit again i want to i want to want to get you over here so we can kind of talk of what's happening in the market because the market will change right we're we're in an ever-changing environment with technology and everything happening in the world the world is constantly changing around us so our strategies as investors have to be adapting to what's uh what's happening in the world so we can continue to win thank you my brother and for all of you listening thank you for listening and or watching latinos and real estate investing podcast body gracias mi hermano Muchas gracias, Martin. thank you so much for having me we'll see you all soon right, brother. all right, right.